Patchwork Heart Ministry and Fiat Ministry Network invite you to discover your mission. A brand new in-depth monthly video series featuring engaging Catholic speakers who will challenge you to live your life abundantly. For only $25 a month, you will receive a personal monthly mission, including three full-length inspirational talks that build upon a new theme each month. Sign up for the Discover Your Mission tier at patreon.com slash Patchwork Heart Ministry today. Welcome to the Sowing Hope Podcast. This is a show all about implanting hope in our hearts. I'm Bill Snyder, joined by my friend Ann DeSantis. We're glad you're here for our uplifting conversation about faith and how it sustains our hearts through all the seasons of life. Thanks for walking with us. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Sewing Hope Podcast. I am Bill Snyder, and as always, I'm joined by Anne DeSantis. It is a uh, wonderful evening here in Wisconsin, just beautiful evening, and we are uh, surviving still in this coronavirus pandemic, but uh, we're doing well this evening. How are you, Anne? Oh, I'm awesome. <laughs> You, you said it best. It's it's beautiful. Even here in southeastern Pennsylvania, couldn't be better. It's a, it's a beautiful evening. It reminds me of June, actually, even though we're in July. Yeah, so good to be here. And I'm very excited about this show. Yeah, it's awesome. Who's our guest tonight? Tell us about our guest. Our guest is Alexandra Andrews. She's from Western New York. She is a fr- Creighton Fertility Care intern. She has a beautiful pro-life story. Her, especially her her life story is really uh, and fascinating, and and so uplifting uh, for all of us. So I'm 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 really, as I said, excited to for people to hear this story. Uh, now I'm going to give you a few websites to learn about Alexandra. I'll, I'll give them now, and of course at the end, uh, she is a Creighton Fertility Care intern. So you can learn about her work at F- Fertility Care Rochester, New York. And then there's a couple other sites that you want to check out. Another one is fertilitycare.org. And lastly, and this is going to be a very interesting part of this podcast, is she is an abortion survivor. And so there's the abortionsurvivors.org website. So Alexandra, I thank you so much for joining us on Sewing Hope. Thank you, Anne and Bill. Um, I'm so excited to be here and I'm just so, yeah, just so excited to share with you and thank you for asking me to come on here and and um, be with you tonight. Yeah, it is a beautiful day, even though here in New York, in Western New York, it's been raining and there's been thunderstorms coming in and out. But personally, I love days like that because you can smell the freshness in the air from the rain when it passes and I love thunderstorms, so it's still a good day. <laughs> it is. Summer's awesome. It really it is. is. Yeah. I forgot to mention that you are also a wife and a mother of, of, of your, your children, little ones, and uh, doing such wonderful work. And uh, I, I thought, Alexandra, we could start out with uh, your life story, because that really is it, it's so uh Beautiful. It's just a beautiful story of, of faith and also of pro-life, uh, the pro-life mission. So I would love to hear that. And I'm sure our listeners would too. Yes. Thank you. Um, no, I know that's why you asked me to be here today to share that. So yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I feel like that's the purpose that God has given me in my life is to be a witness to life and, you know, to just promote that message for him as he's asked me to do. And so, you know, before I start, I want to, I want, before I get into the story, I want to start out with a Psalm that I came across and it was Psalm 118. And it says, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. And I was recently reading that and it just kind of popped out of the the page of my Bible. And I was like, Oh, my goodness, if that isn't like, kind of my story, and a few sentences, 
I don't know what is, but, you know, it's just amazing. So I'll start out by saying, you know, my story began in 1988 and um, in Moscow, Russia, my biological mother was living there. Um, she was a bookkeeper in her late 30s. Um, she had an apartment. And from what I know, she was her father was living with her and he was sick with cancer at the time. Um, she had become pregnant as well and didn't want to be pregnant, did not want to have a child. And so she attempted to have an abortion, which led to the, my premature birth at seven months. And so when I was born, I weighed two and a half pounds. I was 15 inches long. I was born in, you know, clinical hospital number 53, according to my paperwork. And so I was in the hospital for three months. And it wasn't until the end of May, you know, 1988, that my mother had to sign a release form for me to go from the hospital over to state maintenance, you know, uh, an orphanage because I was premature and because as she had listed in the paperwork, she was unable to take care of me. So my, my home then became Moscow Children's Home number 25. As far as I know, my birth mother, you know, returned home. I had no further contact with her and she didn't have any further contact with me. So two years later, it was 1990, and here in, the, here in Western New York, um, my soon-to-become, you know, adoptive parents, they were living in Western New York. My, my mom, she was a 54-year-old, newly retired school teacher and administrator. Um, her husband was 57 years old, and they lived together on a farmhouse, and they had a son who was in a senior in high school, so he was going to be leaving for college soon. And over the over the over 14 years as well, they had a total of six six foster children. So um, at the time that my brother was graduating, there were no more foster children in the home, and you know he was going to be leaving. And so they were going to have an empty house. And and so you know my mother, she. Uh, wasn't like she, like I said, had retired from the school system and loved children. And, you know, she was like, I, I, she always said she didn't like to have an empty house with that, without children in it. So it was, you know, the fall of 1990 and she was getting ready to, you know, to rest for the evening. And so she turned on TV and it was, she was watching, she was going to watch 2020. And the episode that night was entitled Nobody's Children, and it was a follow-up to an April 1990 segment on American couples trying to adopt Romanian orphan orphans. Um, and that particular show that night was bringing to light what was described in that episode as state-run asylums where children with mental and physical defects are banished by a government that has branded them as worthless. So here she is sitting here watching this episode on 2020 she said she, you know she just couldn't hold back the tears she just started crying she called her husband in to watch and you know she thought to him she's they're talking she's like you know here we are we have this beautiful house full of children's toys we're retired from good jobs and these children here they have nothing they you know they most of all don't have a hope for the future and many of the many of them in the up in this episode you know needed medical help they were already handicapped they didn't they weren't getting the help that they needed they didn't have good food no access to education and so she was like you know we have to do something so immediately after that at the end of that episode there was like information to call and get more information on how you could start this process so her and my father got approved to become adoptive parents and you know they were on their search for for a family of children they originally had said you know they would have liked you know, maybe a, f a few children to keep them together. And they de especially wanted a little girl because they hadn't, they didn't have a little girl. So um, a year later, the phone rings and it was the adoption agency. And they were like, oh, well, how would you like a little girl from Russia? And so my mother asked, well, how old is she? And they were like, well, she's, j she's almost four. She's, she's three years. Um, and she was like, well, I don't think so because she's too young. And so the agency was like, well, if you change your mind, we can send you a video overnight by mail. So my father comes home that evening and she tells him and he was like, well, why don't, it doesn't hurt to look at it. Why don't you just send for it? 
and I joke those were like their famous last word because <laughs> they send for the video and and um, so they get this photo and a background of my short life and they spent the whole weekend watching it over and over they're sharing they're sharing it with relatives and friends and and um, my mom said that one point in the video I come up to the window and I was looking out the window and speaking in Russian and apparently there was a bird or something I don't know but I looked back at the camera and I just smiled and she said that it was in that moment in that smile that I gave that she knew like that is my daughter and I have you know that we're gonna bring her home and so um you know it was interestingly enough on it was on December 8th the feast of the Immaculate Conception of Mary that my parents had formally accepted to adopt me and um so that was in 1991 and then it wasn't until April of 1992 that my biological mother consented to the adoption and then from there I was officially considered abandoned by my parents so that was April of 1992 and then it was not until July 31st of the of 92 that I arrived in JFK airport the only belongings I had were you know, the clothes and shoes I was wearing. And at that time, my parents gave me a little white stuffed teddy bear, which I still have to this day. Um, and so that that was how it all started. You know, this, you know, she's just sitting down watching 2020, but then felt called to, you know, to do something about what she was seeing. And, uh, and so, you know, my parents together made that choice. And then I came here and, um, I came here and then I quickly became attached to my new family. Everything was my this, my that. My mama, my papa was very attached to everyone, especially my new mom. And I didn't want her to be out of my sight um, at all. <laughs> um, I, and then the first three months in the U.S., I thrived. I, you know, my mother recalled that after only one week, I was able to count on all five fingers in English. I was able to set the table. I slept through the night. Um, by 10 weeks, I didn't speak Russian anymore, and I spoke English, or I spoke English, and it was funny because my father was originally from Germany, and so everybody jokes that, you know, three months after I came to the U.S., I was correcting his English and his grammar. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, people always remind me of that, and so does he from time to time, so, um, uh, the other thing, too, was um, that I forgot to mention was in that paperwork that my parents had got. The one thing that that it had said was that I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy or what they called spastic paralysis. And it affects my lower extremities. And it, it caused me when I was three years old to walk on my toes like a like a ballerina. Um, and the information my parents also got said that I was developmentally slow with delays in psychomotor and speech development. And I remember my mother had said she took the video to an orthopedic surgeon before they made their decision and asked him, what did he think? And the doctor basically told her, you know, she's as bad as she's going to be because um, cerebral palsy is non-progressive. It won't get any worse. Um, and so he, po the doctor posed the question to my mother, you know, if she does not improve, is this condition acceptable? And, you know, of course she in her heart was like, well, yes, yeah, certainly. And, and she knew that with proper treatment through surgery or having braces and stuff that I could improve with my walking. And so that journey started very quickly after I came to the U.S. as well. It was um, October of 1992. I mean, I came in the end of July, and it was by, um, actually, July, August, like, end of November that I had my first surgery. And so it was over the next seven years that I worked with, you know, an orthopedic surgery, having surgeries and casts and extensive physical therapy to help improve my walking. And so that went really really well and and so that was a blessing too and um in terms of school you know I did I loved school and I loved all my teachers and I loved just being in school and learning and everything like that and um you know growing up through middle school high school you know I I had a pretty 
pretty good. It was pretty, you know, I had a really good support from my family and love and, you know, I had wonderful, great friends and teachers and everything. And I had all the, the support in, in that way, but, and, and my physical wounds were a lot, were very easy to treat, but, um, you know, it was the, the wounds of the, uh, what I call wounds of the heart that, you know, have taken a lifelong through God's grace and a relationship with him to really, to really work on. And, um, and so my parents were very honest with me from, from the get go about me being adopted and, you know, the fact that my mother did attempt an abortion. And, you know, I feel like, I, I think I had to have known that or was aware of what that meant, at least as early as middle school. And, you know, that, that was, as I was very appreciative of their honesty about it, but it was just a really hard thing to know that my mother had done that. Cause not only did she place me for adoption, but before that, you know, I always felt, you know, well, she didn't want me in the first place. So she tried to have an abortion. And then when that didn't fail, you know, she just was like, okay, well, I'm just going to give her to the orphanage. And, and so you know, I always felt different from other adopted children. And I often just felt different from other people in general, just because of, of that wound. And um, some, you know, there is, um, there is a psychologist who, uh, as I was doing research on p children that are adopted and things like that, um, a psychologist, I believe she is, Nancy Verrier, who calls this the primal wound. And and that this, the trauma and the separation that occurs between the biological mother and the child can cause, um, can cause physiological, psychological, and spiritual, like, disruption of that bonding that the mother and the child should have, and that that separation is felt subconsciously, and it creates, you know, fear of separation, fear of abandonment, from the adopted family, other people in the children's life, and it can lead to so low self-esteem, abandonment, rejection, anxiety, and, you know, can lead to depression as well. But the, the hardest thing for me growing up was just that feeling of rejection and just feeling that I was unwanted by my birth mother, you know, and it, it deeply impacted my self-esteem, my feelings of self-worth. And, you know, I had struggled with separation anxiety you know as I said when I first arrived to the U.S. I was very attached to my mother you know I didn't want to be out of her sight and anytime I was I was just you know I would just cry and so you know it was just it, it was interesting because you know from my biological parents or my adoptive parents and you know the wonderful family that I had and the great support system that I had you know I had all of those things that you would need to, to have, you know, to make good, to make good attachments with people and form a healthy, healthy, I'm kind of losing my words here, but you know, it wasn't, I guess what I'm trying to say is despite all of those things, it, it wasn't enough to prevent having these feelings. You know, I knew that my adoptive parents and the people that I that were surrounding me and they're supporting me that they loved me that I was wanted by them and you know all of that but it, you know there was just something still deep inside of me that I'm like well that you know it wasn't enough to to heal all of that that's yeah, yeah that's what I'm trying to say you know and so and the, you know that's where um you know thankfully having been raised um Catholic and Christian and knowing about God that, you know, he, God is always, God was always there. And I always knew about, knew about his existence and, and, and things like that. And that really helped me to, you know, help me to be in a place where I don't think I could have been without that, without that knowledge. And so it's just really, really wonderful. <laughs> It is. It is. Yeah. And I know I will tell our viewer, our listeners, I, I should say here on this podcast that you are a person of deep faith. So how yeah. the Lord has worked in your life is just amazing. I love your story. I have to admit, when you tell your story, 
a lot of tears are being held back <laughs> because yeah. you mentioned the story on TV, the 2020 episode. Now I was about 25 at the time. And I remember distinctly watching that program and just being heartbroken to see these little orphans. Mm -hmm. So it's a real visual for me in my own life. And I'm sure that someone who's listening may remember back in the early 90s when uh, the TV show on ABC 2020 uh, had those episodes having to do with uh, Russian and Romanian orphans. Yeah. And it was very powerful. So uh, your mother's inspiration through the Holy Spirit, knowing that God was speaking to her, is just uh, a wonderful and awesome thing to hear. And how God has worked in your life and is continuing to work in your life, despite any um, challenges that you have had with, yeah. as you said, with the wounds and things like that. So I just commend you. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, just going forward you know, I'd love to share what, how has God worked in my life? And, yeah. you know, it was really interesting because, um, you know, my, my adoptive parents from the very beginning, you know, especially my mother made it known to me that I was accepted, not just as their adopted daughter, but I was their daughter, you know, and, and that was just a beautiful thing. And, and so unfortunately my my mother, Pat, you know, she passed away almost, uh, you know, it, well, it's been five years. And, you know, when I lost her, that was devastating. I, you know, it was the one person in my life that I, you know, I felt like I didn't have to work to earn her love. I knew that she was going to be there for me and I could trust her without condition. I knew she had always loved me for me, not, you know, and didn't care about the, the cerebral palsy or all of those things and all of the struggles that I dealt with none of that was mattered to her you know she just loved me for me and and I never realized until after she was gone that how much of my identity was grounded in her and how she accepted me and you know right before she died I had my first son like and so at the you know two really big important things happened at the same time you know I have my very first child and then you know, not just over a week later, she passed away. And, you know, and so it was just, you know, both of those things at the time, after that happened, I was like, I was really aching for true healing. And, and in my heart and soul, and, you know, through, through the years, I had, you know, ever since I was a young child, I've been in, you know, my parents knew that um, seeking out therapy for me was, going to be something I would need. And so I would always, at times, utilize that resource. And I would all, you know, as part of that, I would keep a journal. And often in the journal, I would be writing to God, you know, please help me. I don't want to keep feeling these feelings of rejection or always feeling like anxious, you know, yeah. show me that you how you love me or what my purpose is, and this and that. And so you know, the painful wounds and feelings of rejection that I had as a child, I was now viewing as a mother too, because I, you know, now that I've had my own child, I was like, how could my birth mother choose to abort me? And then how could she, you know, when that didn't work, just so easily abandon me? I'm like, And then it brought up all those new questions. Why didn't she want me? And, and, you know, she couldn't have forgotten me. You know, it was Mother's Day, you know, if it was Mother's Day, maybe a year or two after my son was born and my mom had died that, you know, I, you know, I thought about her and, and I, you know, she just came to the forefront a lot more once my mother had passed and I had a child and all of that. And I was working with a counselor at the time and, you know, telling him about these things. And he said something to me that really resonated. And he was like, you know, he had worked at pregnancy crisis centers with women that have had abortions. And he said, mothers that are faced with this choice are making probably most likely the hardest decision of their life. And no, and as they're making that decision, either way, it's not a personal rejection of their baby or who that baby is becoming in the womb or may or may not become in the future. So he pointed out, you know, when your mother made that decision to have an abortion, she didn't know that you were going to grow up to be a girl with blonde hair and blue eyes who would one day grow up to, you know, have two children or 
be a nurse and so that I couldn't take her rejection personally against who I was as a person. And he said, you know, God's acceptance and love for you has to be greater than her rejection of you. God chose me. You know, every single person is chosen by God and his love for us needs to supersede all other love. And I want to take a moment and take take a look in scripture. At what does it mean to be chosen by God? I came across this verse in Romans just last night, actually. And it and it says, for those who are led by for those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you receive a spirit of adoption through which you we cry, Abba, Father. And then if, you know, you go, going on a little bit further in scripture, in, scripture, in 1, John 3, 1 John 3, verse 1, it says, See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. And, you know, when you think about what does it mean to have a spirit of adoption? Um, and so as I was um, thinking more on that verse, and I was watching this show called Wild Goose um, on Formed, if anyone has that, it's wonderful. You should watch the show. The, the Wild Goose is a show about the Holy Spirit. But the episode I was watching was all about this spirit of adoption. What does that mean? Well, it was saying that in Roman law, for a person to be adopted, it was a really intricate process. It had a lot of legal consequences and that when a person became adopted, they became ra radically new. Their name was changed. Any money or debt that they had was canceled. They became a new person and that old person was gone. And that the, the adopted person claimed all the rights, benefits, heritage, inheritance, and blessings and gifts as the, as bi as the biological children as well. And so Roman law also said that if you had a, your, a biological child and something went wrong with them and you decided you didn't want the child, that you could abandon it at birth. But that was not the case with adoption. With adoption, you could never abandon that child because the thought was you knew what you were getting into when you saw this child. You knew what infirmities they had. You knew what disabilities they had. You knew choosing that child all of these things and so if you made that choice to have to accept that child and adopt them you could never walk away from it you are forever united to that child as father or mother son or daughter and you know as i'm watching this last night i was just in tears because it you know it brought me back to my bio or my uh well to my biological mother because again you know you know she was like well i can't have this child i don't want it and just decided to abandon me but then on the flip side you know here were my adoptive parents saying, we know what your infirmities are. We knew what your disabilities were up front, but we're going to make that choice anyway. And we'll never walk away from you. And, and, you know, it was just beautiful when you take that and you apply it, you know, a million fold to God and his relationship with you. Jesus radically changes our relationship with God. You know, we don't have to look at God as like him being the master and we're the servant, but through Jesus dying on the cross, you know, now it's, he's our father and we're his daughter or we're his son. And, you know, that God delights in us. He, he wants us to approach him and, and rejoices in us. And, you know, it's just the Holy Spirit is amazing in that. And as I, as I was sitting there thinking, you know, it's always been so amazing to me to think back on my adoptive parents and be like, how much the spirit was working in them for them to make that decision to say, you know, here we are in our fifties when other people thought they were probably crazy to say, we're going to adopt a four-year-old little girl. And, you know, obviously God's hand was in all of it. And, you know, as I talk about the Holy spirit to, you know, and, and how God has been working with me about two years ago, it was during Holy week. And I was, in the church praying after holy thursday mass and our church has this beautiful crucifix in it and um and with in in the one we have in our church jesus actually had isn't it hasn't died yet he's still on the cross and his eyes are open and he's looking down but you could see his eyes and so i was just sitting there in prayer you know, and just looking up at his face and at that moment I had like this over like this intense feeling in love 
intense feeling of love and peace come over me, like over my whole body. I don't know where it came from. And, and in that, well, I know I'm looking back now, I'm like, you know, that was the Holy Spirit. But and in that moment, I just felt like in my heart that Jesus was like, I love you. And in that moment, I had like no more feelings of rejection, no more feelings of anxiety. You know, I knew that deep down in my soul in that moment, he truly did love me. And, you know, like I said, God loves all of us and he loved us so much. He chose to bring us into existence and because he wants us to have a relationship with him. And, you know, something from that moment on changed in me. I can't explain how it worked, how it happened. I just know that it was God through the Holy Spirit working with me. And, and through that, you know, the Holy Spirit put this renewed fire in my soul and wanted me to you know, want it, it caused me to want to have a deeper relationship with God. And, over, and, and in that, I've just been able to have so much healing, you know, that I've been praying for over the past 30 years. And, you know, looking through scripture again, I, you know, I want to go to Genesis for a moment. And, you know, when you look at Genesis, it says, you know, God created man and woman out of love because he loved us. He wants a relationship with us. We were created in his image and likeness and we were perfect. And everything, you know, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve truly knew God. They loved him. They knew they were loved by him. And that relationship was perfect. And then, of course, um, you know, it says man and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. And, you know, they didn't have any reason to feel shame or fear in their hearts because of their perfection through God. And then, of course, you know, tragedy strikes and Satan deceives Adam and Eve. And then after that deception, Genesis 3 goes on to say the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden and the cool of the day and the man and wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord called out to them and said, why, where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then the Lord asks, who told you that you were naked? And I came across that verse over the last couple of years, years and just um, that another that was another thing that kind of like hit me, you know, after, after Adam and Eve were deceived before they even realized that God was out looking for them. He was out trying to restore this relationship with them. And, and they didn't even realize and what they're, they were doing is trying to run and hide. And, and, and then, um, you know, God asks them, well, who told you that you were naked? And then, God gives them an answer, <laughs> you know, that, that it was Satan that deceived them. And, and that I was like, you know, looking in my own life, who was telling me throughout my life that I was, or who was giving me these feelings inside of unworthiness that, you know, I wasn't loved or that I wasn't enough, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't what, it wasn't truly my birth mother. I mean, she made that choice, but you know, it was Satan that was taking what she did and using it against me to, to have all these feelings of, you know, feeling not lovable and not enough. And, you know, the, the rest of scripture is just a continual story of God seeking out his creation and, and, and humanity. And, and so, you know, Pope John Paul also reminds us that God seeks out man because he's moved by his fatherly heart and that this search begins in his heart and comes to fullness in the incarnation of Christ. God seeks out man because he loves him eternally in the word and wishes to raise him in Christ to the dignity of an adoptive son. So again, you know, through Jesus Christ, we're all adopted and chosen by God. And it's, it's just beautiful. And having, you know, obviously having been adopted and knowing or having an example of that kind of like on a human level through my adoptive parents choosing me when I apply that to what that means in scripture and through God, it's just like, it's even more great. And, you know, God had, God was opening my eyes to who my enemy really was, you know, Genesis three, God says to, or, um, you know, after that act, you know, God says to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring and yours. And so, you know, there's that, that, 
that fighting there from the beginning against Satan and, and humanity. And then in Revelation 12, you know, it talks about how the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. And if you think about that, that's kind of, you know, spiritually speaking, the culture of death is, is reflected or the results of sin and this are reflected through that through that passage in Revelation 12. You know, and so I realized that, you know, one lie that I carried my whole life was that my mother and her rejection of, or what I thought her was her rejection of me was to, was to blame for all the feelings that I had. And that wasn't true. And on the, and then extending that even further, I realized, you know, when I was younger and growing up, like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about my biological mother. Honestly, I had feelings of hatred towards her. And, you know, I, it wasn't until I was realizing all of this that I was like, you know, Satan's been using all of this against me, but at the same time, what has he done to her that she was even in this place to make this decision or, you know, felt that this was the best way that she could make this decision. And, you know, another you know that's kind of another lie that satan has and through a through abortion certainly tells that you're not wanted you're not allowed you're not loved you're not enough and and that that lie kind of held me captive all my life and and really held me back and at times i felt kind of i guess you could say like suffocated by it because i was trying to move forward and i just couldn't and you know um it wasn't until i came to the this fullness of of what God was showing me that, that, you know, I, I didn't, I shouldn't view my mother as my enemy and she, because she's, she's not. And, you know, and that, you know, my biological mother, that is of course. And, and, you know, God was, was trying to restore, restore me to help me to realize all of these beautiful things. And, you know, I was reflecting on Jesus's words from the cross where he says, you know, father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And God placed it on my heart that my mother truly didn't know the fullness of what she was doing when she was making this decision to have an abortion. You know, she was being deceived as well. And I truly believe that she couldn't have understood the fullness of the implications of her decision and how they would affect, how they affect both you know, the effects that they have spiritually and theologically, psychologically, morally, emotionally. And, you know, so with that understanding, I was, I told myself, you know, if Jesus can forgive from the cross. I can forgive my mother. And, you know, ever since I was able to, to make that decision every day to forgive, it, it's just been very freeing. And, you know, so you, some might say, well, you know, how that I would be easily justified in not wanting to forgive because of what she tried to do. I mean, you know, Mother Teresa and all of her, you know, with all of her work and with the poor, she was quoted in saying that um, in the 20 years of work among the people, I've come more and more to realize that being unwanted is the worst disease that any human being can experience. For all kinds of disease, there are medicines and cures, but for being unwanted, except there are willing hands to serve and there's a loving heart to love. I don't think this t terrible disease can ever be cured. And, you know, so like I said, one could say that I was, e that I would be easily justified in saying, you know, I can't forgive the fact that, you know, the fact that my mother tried to have, you know, tried to abort me, but, you know, I feel like, you know, me not wanting to forgive her would just be, you know, causing me further damage as it had been, you know, all those years when I was just angry at her and, and, mm. and so having, having my eyes been opened through God and just through having a relationship with him and through scripture, it's, I've, you know, had a lot of healing and realizing who my, who my enemy is and, and that there's so much power in forgiveness. And, you know, I won't, you know, forgiveness is not a feeling, it's a conscious choice. I mean, just like love is a conscious choice, but it's, you know, forgiveness is that act of the mind and the heart and the spirit. It's private and an ongoing choice that you have to renew daily in your heart. And that, 
your capacity to forgive does not depend on the other person's behavior or their permission or even their expression of remorse for the behavior. But it just means, you know, forgiveness just means willing good to the offender, willing greater prosperity and goodness and wholeness in their lives. And, you know, C.S. Lewis stated that love is unselfishly choosing for another their highest good. So to forgive is an act of love. And, you know, if I if I could meet my biological mother and, and tell her anything, I would tell her that I love her and that I do forgive her. And, you know, I would hope, you know, my prayer for her is that I hope she knows the love of Christ and, and the redemption and forgiveness and healing that is found in him. And, yeah, you know, that's what God has done in my life. And it's just been amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. Totally. I mean, you have an amazing story, Alexandra. I mean, what an amazing story that you have. And, and, you know, I, I think a large piece uh, of the reason why we, we've just let you share is because uh, it is so powerful and um, I, I'm moved by it. I'm sure there are uh, a lot of people uh, listening to this that are deeply moved by what you're sharing with us. And um, I, I really encourage people, you know, it's not every day you hear a story of um, somebody surviving abortion. You know, there are, like, we don't hear this. We don't hear firsthand accounts of this stuff. And um, your, your courage to be able to even speak about this uh, publicly you know, it, it's it's one thing to overcome it privately and to and to have a, you know, re- relationship with the Lord and um, o- overcome this, but then to even have the the courage to begin uh, doing ministry with this and sharing it publicly on radio and, and, and TV <laughs> is is a totally another uh, level. And so, I I thank you so much. I'm sure there's a little bit of a of a feeling of duty that you have to share it because um, of what God has done in your life. But what an amazing blessing uh, for our listeners and all the listeners uh, that will be listening to this later um, to, to grow in their faith and know that, you know, these, these decisions that are made um, in, in one moment um, of somebody's life has, has such a profound impact on another's life. I think, you know, it's one of those um, things where it, where it talks to us and speaks to our heart about the connectedness of human uh, beings, the connectedness of our um, actions and good actions and bad actions and sinful nature and, um, and virtuous nature that, that, that we uh, try to live out throughout our lives, right? When we, when we build up mm-hmm. the kingdom of God, it's not just impacting us, it's impacting others. And when we sin, it's not just impacting us, it's impacting others. And I think y- you've captured that in what you've shared with us today so beautifully that we, we as, um, as listeners to this story have to, have to take this to heart. And so just thank you for sharing this. Uh, from, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for sharing this with our, with our listeners today because I, I am totally um blown away and and so um oh, you know I, I i hate to say overjoyed but i'm just so blown away by the fact that you have um been so open and transparent and honest with us um and and shared the depths of your heart with us um this is truly unbelievable and i just hope people put this on repeat uh, and, and listen to this and share this with as many people as they can because um, you're you are in such a small minority of people who have experienced and survived abortion that um, that that is a powerful powerful witness and we have to and we have to do our best to spread that and and end uh, the injust the great injustice of abortion in our in our nation and in our world. Amen. And I'll just add that I everything that Bill said I agree wholeheartedly. I had to wipe my eyes a couple times during your talk. And this is the second time I've heard it because uh, you were on my other show, which people can go to this podcast as well, or even the video on Journeys in Faith with Ann DeSantis. It's on Patchwork Heart Ministry and also Fiat Ministry Network. You can listen to another show where 
uh, Alexandra gives her story. So it's been wonderful so far and how the Holy Spirit worked in uh, Betty's life too, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I praise God. As I said, it is a big memory for me, that 2020 program where I watched it and thought, wow, if I could adopt uh, a little one and your mother went ahead and did it. So yeah. praise the Lord. And, and I can understand what you said. She was 54 years old. I mean, I'll tell our listeners here. I mean, I'm 55, so I can imagine what would it have been like for me at my age to adopt a little three or four year old child from another country is just uh, so beautiful. And, and your life is a wonderful testimony to the pro-life message. And I'm so wonderful, wonderfully grateful to you for being a guest, not only on this podcast, but on Journeys in Faith. Uh, now we have about 10 or 15 minutes left. So I wanna make sure Alexandra, that we have a chance to talk about your other work if we could. Um, you are a Creighton Fertility Care intern. So I wondered if you could also share with us a little bit about that work that you're doing. Yeah, certainly. Um, I will. Well, I just wanted to um, comment on what Bill said real quick before I um, talk about that. But, you know, talking about how, you know, this was a personal journey and then I was able to have the strength to, to you know, do things like this and, you know, go out in public and, and give this testimony. But, you know, it, I have to say it was all the Holy Spirit and it was all God you know, throughout my life and in little ways here and there, I feel like he kept asking me, you need to tell this story. You need to tell this story. And my adoptive mother had written a book about adopting me from Russia. And so many people knew the story from her book and, and knew that part of it. And they would come to me and they would be like, you know, you have such a powerful message and God really has a purpose for you. And they would, they would tell me this. And I would always be like, yeah, thank you. And I, I just, I, I didn't really know how to respond. I, you know, I didn't, it's not that I didn't believe what they said, but I just, I was just like, I don't know what my purpose is. I really don't understand why this all happened. And, you know, it wasn't until I had this, you know, personal healing inside and being able to go through this journey of forgiveness and really understanding what it meant to be a child of God and, and, you know, all of these things that I was like, okay, God, you've been asking me for a long time to share this. And I finally said to him, I said, yes, I will share it. And so, you know, one of my favorite, one of, I think my all time favorite Bible verse that for some reason was pointed out to me many times in my life is from Jeremiah 29, 11, where it says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, to give you hope in a future. And, you know, that verse would always stick out you know, over the years, and I always kept it close. And, you know, I know now what God's plan and purpose are for me. You know, he gave me this hope and this future. He brought me out of this orphanage in Russia to the U.S. to become a, a messenger of his, his love, his mercy, you know, the power of forgiveness, you know, to, pro to proclaim the gospel through my test, through my life. You know, I realized that that's what God has called me to do. That's what my purpose has been all along and you know what satan meant for evil and to destroy through abortion god meant for his purpose and to do good and so i just feel like to not share that message of god's mercy and forgiveness and love would be contrary to what he asks of us every day yeah. and so that's why i was like you know what i will i will do this and you know the Crichton fertility care thing was kind of another saying yes to god you know and so the correct the fertility, the Crichton fertility care. Um, I'm an intern, like you said, and so I'm. What what the Crichton fertility care is is it is a it is a um, fertility awareness based method of um, natural family planning and women's health um, monitoring of their you know reproduction reproductive system and their fertility. And so my decision to do that was was kind of it all tied in with my whole life story, really, you know, um, obviously I'm pro-life and, you know, the values of that every person has dignity and value in the eyes of God is just so, you know, that's just so strong for me that I felt that becoming a, 
a Creighton fertility care practitioner was just one another way that I could go out and promote life. And so that's why I decided to do it. And so I teach women and couples how to monitor, you know, monitor their, um, their cycles and know the health of their fertility every single day. And with that, they can make decisions, you know, whether they want to achieve a pregnancy, avoid a pregnancy, or, you know, just monitor the health of their reproduction if they're not, you know, even if they're not looking to achieve or avoid a pregnancy, they can do that as well. But it does, you know, the Creighton Fertility Care System, you know, just ties in that whole um, fundamental human dignity and that, you know, every person's life is valuable and that, you know, before before we even know about God, he is, he knows about us and is, you know, we were created and it's just amazing. And so that's why I decided to become a fertility care intern. And, and, you know, that's been an amazing journey too. And that has also helped with my own personal healing and my own personal journey. And, and so that's why I chose to do that. And it's been wonderful. I really enjoy doing it. And it's just great because I know that, um, I can help other women to see that as well in case they, you know, may not realize these things, um, other women and couples. And so it's just a beautiful thing, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for the, and thank you for the witness and thank you for, uh, the work that you do. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see, uh, that, that you've, obviously taken this pro-life message because you understand it, you know, more intimately probably than, uh, you know, a- anybody else, um, you know, outside of, you know, those who have also survived abortions. So, you know, which, which is rare in number, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. that, that way you have, you know, taken it to heart and you've, and you've not only, um, made, you know, a public statement about, about your your journey but you've also made um it your life's work to to make sure that that um new new life is created in a way that is in harmony with with what god wills for human beings and um i i think that that is such a beautiful uh testimony in itself uh just to just to know w- just to know so much of who you are, um, and and how uh, God is calling you to to live day to day, you know that that's a special gift, um, and and one that um, one that has has just has me riveted. So so thank you for <laughs> for your um, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Like it I has said. me riveted too. Honestly, it does, and I thank you. So grateful that I met you. And I will tell our viewer, our listeners again, that you are located in Western New York. And her name again is Alexandra Ann Andrews. She's a mother and a wife and a Creighton fertility care intern who is also also an abortion survivor. What a beautiful story that we heard on this podcast. I'm going to give our listeners those websites again, and then I'm going to turn it over to you as we come to the end of this show, if there's any other final words, but I will tell them that they can learn more about the work that you do at fertilitycarerochesterny.com. And on that website, you can also connect with Alexandra Andrews. In addition, you can go to fertilitycare.org. And lastly, for those who are interested in learning more about abortion survivors, you can go to abortionsurvivors.org. So I wanted to make sure to mention that. And on social media, her name is Alexandra Ann, that's A-N-N. So Alexandra, would you have any uh, final words before the end of the show? We're ending in about five minutes or so. Oh, um, yeah, I think the greatest thing that I just want to say is just, you know, I read something somewhere that said the greatest sin against the Holy Spirit is despair. And, you know, throughout my life before, as I was going through all this, there were many times that despair left, left me feeling powerless to the anxiety and the feelings that I had. And, and 
I felt powerless to be able to forgive or to move beyond the things that I, that happened that I was, you know, that I knew I couldn't change the circumstances of how I came into the world. And, and because of that, you know, many times despair made me feel like I can't do anything about this, but, you know, God relentlessly pursued me and, and throughout my whole life and, and changed me. And I, I just want to tell anyone that's listening that, you know, no matter what has happened to you in your life, that God can do the same thing for you and that, you know, run to him and ask him for him to heal you and for his mercy and for him to be able to help you forgive, you know, things that may have happened to you in your life, because all of those things that God is able to do for me, I know, and I'm a hundred percent certain he can do for anyone else. And he will, if you go to him and, you know, that that's probably the biggest thing. I mean, it doesn't matter what you've done. You can go to God and ask him for forgiveness and for his mercy and he'll give it to you. All you have to do is ask. And, you know, it took me a really long time for, for my eyes to be opened and to, and to really know that and be confident in it and to let God work in me and to bring me to where I am today. So I just urge, urge anyone, you know, reflect in your own life, where are areas that you need to, that you've been asking God to heal, you know, even if it's been 20, 30 years that you've been praying the same prayer over and over again, don't give up because it took that long for me, but you know, I'm so glad that God has brought me to where I am now. And, you know, it's a continual journey and, uh, you know, it's not over for me and it's, you know, it's not over for any of us as long as we're still here on earth. And, you know, every day we have that, have those choices to love and to forgive and to, and to have that relationship with God and seek him out. And, and so I just want to leave people with that bit of encouragement that, you know, God has a plan for each and every one of us. And if you don't know how that's working in your life yet, or how that relates to you yet, just keep holding on to it until it, until God fully reveals what that means for you, because he will. And, you know, you are chosen by God. We all are. You're his, you're his son or you're his daughter and he is your father. And even if you aren't fully aware of that, it's, it's the truth. And, um, yeah, God is just amazing. And that's, <laughs> that's what I want to leave us with. I think you're putting a smile on more than one face. Mine is certainly smiling. I know that the Lord is smiling down on you. And I just have a feeling in my heart that Betty, your mother is also uh, watching down and, and has a, a smile and love in her heart because she's still with you. Yes. Thank you. I know she is. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for being a guest on the Sewing Hope podcast. Please come back again, Alexandra. Oh, I would love I to. really enjoy. We love you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes. Like I said, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity and, and God bless you both. And, uh, and yeah, anytime I'd love to. That's awesome. It's been great. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And um, yeah, just just an amazing witness, uh, an amazing story. And please, folks, uh, it, head over to uh, you know our, our Facebook pages, our, our Instagram sites. Uh, it's just uh, very simple. All you got to do is search for Sewing Hope, uh, especially if you're um, you know not a regular listener of the program. We have many different interviews, but but go listen to this one again. Uh, if you're listening live, listen to this one again. You're gonna need to. Uh, there's so many different um, aspects of the power of God in, in Alexandra's story that we, we want, you just need to go back and listen to this. I need to go back and listen to it again. Um, so, so thank you um, to each and every one of you for tuning in. Uh, and thank you, as always, for, um, for being uh, a, great, a great co-host. And, uh, and why don't you tell us just who's going to be up tomorrow night on Journeys in Faith? Yes, I am extremely excited uh, for tomorrow's show, Journeys in Faith, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, as Michael Rosala. He is a Catholic author and also a pastoral associate, also located in the Western New York area. So it's going to be a good one. Please join us at Fiat Ministry Network on Facebook Live. And of course, it's going to be a podcast after the fact on On Demand on Patchwork Heart Ministry. Alexandra, again, thank you so much. And thank Bill, you. thank you too for a wonderful podcast this evening with you, as always. Of
as always, my friend. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, it has been wonderful. Uh, but uh, from all of us here at Patchwork Heart Ministry, thanks so much for tuning in tonight to Sewing Hope. And know we'll be back next Tuesday morning with another episode. But thanks for being here and tuning in. Until next time, from all of us at Patchwork Heart Ministry and the St. Raymond Anatas Foundation, I'm Bill Snyder. Keep beating to your Catholic heart, sowing hope into broken hearts. Thanks for listening to this episode of Sowing Hope on Patchwork Heart Radio. For more information about this podcast and our ministries, visit our websites, patchworkheart.org and andesantis.com. You can also follow and interact with us on Twitter at PWH Ministry or AndySantis2. Patchwork Heart Ministry and Fiat Ministry Network invite you to discover your mission. A brand new in-depth monthly video series featuring engaging Catholic speakers who will challenge you to live your life abundantly. For only $25 a month, you will receive a personal monthly mission, including three full-length inspirational talks that build upon a new theme each month. Sign up for the Discover Your Mission tier at patreon.com slash patchworkheartministry today.